Hi everybody. Hi, I'm Chloe. I'm the Vice President of Cornell Students for Animal Rights. And we are so excited today to present our speaker, Christopher Sebastian. Christopher Sebastian divides his time between London and New York City. His background is in journalism and media studies. Um, and he started working more directly in animal rights about six years ago. He's on the advisory council for Encompass. He is part-time lecturer at Columbia University and social media director of the Peace Advocacy Network. In addition, he provides uh, writing and research support for a well-fed world. His work focuses on examining the complex relationships between the struggles for animal liberation, black liberation, and queer liberation. Please welcome Christopher Sebastian. Thank you. Come Searching out. for a beach vacation, find it at Clarabo. <laughs> <laughs> this thing doesn't shut up. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to spend an embarrassing amount of time attaching the microphone to myself. Maybe this won't be so bad. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. All the folks in the cheap seats? In the back, if you can hear me, put your hands up. Throw your hands in the air, wave your hands. All right. Cool. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you also to, um, to Cornell Students for Animal Rights for having me again. Um, and thank you also to the interpreters that we have here, um, like Lucia and Mar Marika. Marika, thank you again so much for that. Um, like one of the things that's really important to me is inclusion um, as much as we can. And the fact that Cornell is also equally dedicated to making sure that we have ex accessible spaces for people insofar as they're able to do that. That is, that, that's one of the reasons why I really love coming here so much. So thank you to them. Um, and please give a round of applause to them for, for being here. So um, in addition to that really awesome introduction that, um, that Chloe just gave me, one of the things that I'm really commonly known for is being uh, such a uniting force. Um, because nothing brings people together better than their common hatred of an individual. And um, <laughs> if there's anything that I've known to do, it's to piss off um, black people who really, really don't want to hear about animal liberation. And um, like the people who are really, really into animal liberation who are commonly white really don't want to hear about racism. So like you get these two people together, um, you know, and it's kind of like that meme where, like, you know, the, the arms are interlocked and then there's this me in the middle. Um, they, they really can't stand me. Um, I draw a lot of attention for all of the wrong reasons, and oddly enough, it does not keep me up at night at all. Um, one of the things that I really hear from my uh, socially progressive friends is that uh, they don't have time for animal rights. Like, it's this sort of tangential issue that's off on the side that no one really cares about because we have to focus on the real problem defeating capitalism. And like I had gotten into it like a couple of months ago with um, a friend of mine who is really progressive. Like she cares about all of these issues, like you know, like like child labor, um, like making our clothes fast fashion is evil, and like you know, like capitalism doesn't allow us time to do anything important. And so she really cares about black liberation and queer liberation, and women's liberation, and all of these human focused issues and so she's like we have to fight capitalism that's the like that's the major scourge that we need to defeat and i don't ever think that i'm the most like intelligent person in the room so i said to her like you know what let's have a conversation about this um how do we fight capitalism what are some of the ways that we can adopt into our everyday lives that will help us to like take down this like unwieldy monster that, um, that, that we're all caught up in. And so we started looking online, and what you see here on this first slide is actually um, an article that we found together when we were discussing. Um, and this is from The Guardian. Um, from recycling to fair phones, 24 ways to lead an anti-capitalist life in a capitalist world. And so we said, oh, this looks like a really good starting place. Let's look at some of the tips that they recommend. And um, really high up on the list, and you can see here there's a adoring, adorable picture of a 
a hipster who's sitting in a sewing machine. It says make your own clothes. So this we're off to an auspicious start, by the way. Um, like I no longer buy my own clothes, says Clea Whitley, 33 from London. I've spent the past 11 months learning how to make them myself. Um, I, I don't know anybody. Like people say, oh, like you know, veganism is like you know, it, it's it's so racist and classist because you expect poor people to eat rice and beans. And I'm like, I don't know many poor people who have the time to make their own clothes, but let's just continue on the list and see what we come up with. So the next one, stop buying soap. This may not be for everyone or anyone, but it's certainly complicated, but a reader who wishes to remain anonymous for reasons that I cannot imagine <laughs> says, I haven't bought washing detergent, shampoo, or conditioner since June. Really. I wash my hair with soap nut liquid, which I obviously can find in the local Pathmark. Um, shampoo and conditioner, like I, I wash my hair with soap nut liquid followed by apple cider vinegar. It takes a bit of pre-planning because the soap nut liquid spoils after a week. But it takes no time at all to boil the soap nuts on a Sunday evening or mix the vinegar with water. Is that right? Uh, let's continue. Let's see what else we've got. Make your own spreadable butter. These are recommendations that people honestly have for how to defeat capitalism. A small contribution, perhaps, but creditably ingenious. You just have to mix butter with oil. Really? Really? This is what we're doing? But this is, the, this is the one that actually took me out, like the third one here um, on this slide. Let's see what we've won. Brute Drew Rubbish. And this is where I actually had to stop reading and look at my friend and say, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> this is absurd. This is absolutely, like, on its best day, if going vegan is racist and classist, I have to tell you that nothing is more racist and classist to me than telling four people that they should root through the trash. <laughs> that is just categorically absurd, and we're not having this conversation any longer. I have far better solutions for how we're going to defeat capitalism, and they don't involve making soap, making butter, or, or dipping through. I just, I can't imagine, like, why these are things that people would say to me um, with a completely straight face. Like, really, like, when you take animals off your plate and off of your bodies, it, it absolutely, this is like, really, we have to eat at least once a day, most of us, if we're lucky, two or three times a day. This is a conscious decision that we can make as often as possible that improves the quality of life for everyone around us. It takes so many parts of, it takes so many variables out of the equation where we're having conversations about how to change the world. And so, like, she, she had absolutely conceded my point. She didn't go vegan on the spot. She did actually um, commit to being vegetarian. I was very proud of that moment. But really, like, it, what, what, what really illuminate, was illuminated in this moment for me was the fact that like, we have so many platitudes in progressive circles about how we're going to change the world, but we don't really know what they mean. They're just words. We say well, we want to fight capitalism. Well, how? How are we going to do that? Like, what tools do we have available for us to do that in our everyday lives? And this is a hugely powerful one. And it's a necessary one if we're going to save the planet that we're living on, if we're talking about things like climate change as well. Um, that's not the topic of the conversation today. Um, it's much more incendiary. We want to actually talk about animal exploitation and white identity politics. Um, which, again, like, you know, it's a really sensitive topic to talk about, and it doesn't really make me a lot of friends, but that's okay. I already interact with far too many people, like, you know, on the regular anyhow, so, like, I don't need more friends. But, um, but yeah, like, I actually am going to be doing this, um, this lecture this weekend in Berkeley at the Conscious Eating Conference, um, and I got a lot of pushback. Um, I can't imagine why. But this was just a really necessary thing for us to talk about, and particularly this, um, this, this, this day and time, like the, the current political climate that we're living in um, really wanted, it really begged me to explore this topic in depth um, because there is a lot of overlap between like animal exploitation and white national identity in particular in our country today. Um, and like I actually was going to start with like, you know, some of the ways that people were, like, you know, were, were coming for me when it was announced that this, um, this lecture was going to be part of the, part of the, the um, part of the conference this coming weekend, um, people were like, oh, this doesn't have anything to, this, this is just a diversity agenda that's being pushed too far, this doesn't have anything to do with animal rights. 
race is a completely separate issue. And I understand that a lot of people have arguments for compartmentalizing different social justice issues. But really, these things have a lot, of, a lot to do with each other. And we need to recognize the importance of commonality between different issues um, rather than trying to compartmentalize them so much. Um, this first slide here actually was the, like, it was my introduction to, to wanting to explore this in, in greater detail. This is an image from the, um, the CPAC uh, 2019, the Conservative Political Action Conference. Um, what you're looking at is uh, former White House staffer Sebastian Gorka. And um, at CPAC, seemingly pe people, and in particular Republicans, they just couldn't stop talking about meat for some reason. Um, Sebastian Gorka is actually saying here in this quote, they want to take your pickup truck. They want to rebuild your home. They want to take away your hamburgers. Um, I've written an entire essay about this. He shouted from the lectern, this is what Stalin dreamt about but never achieved. You are on the front lines of the war against communism coming back to America under the guise of democratic socialism. I thought that this was particularly hilarious because if he knew anything about Stalin at all, it's that Stalin had sent emissaries to the United States um, to study food production, and when they returned, he actually had implemented the mass production of hamburgers in his own country. And so not only is like not only is Sebastian Gorka wrong, he's like he's talking about this in a completely like bizarre way. When he says they want to take away your pickup trucks and rebuild your home and take away your hamburgers, he's talking about these these bogeymen that are essentially Democrats, or as I like to call them, normal people who just actually want the world to be better for everyone involved. But he's not the only one. Like I said, several people at CPAC were actually echoing similar sentiments. Um, Jerry Falwell Jr., um, he said, I have 100 cows. You just let Alexandria Cortez show up and try to take my cows away. And then you've got Donald Trump Jr. who says, I love cows, they're delicious. <laughs> Mark Meadows says, with this Green New Deal, they're trying to get rid of all the cows. Oh no, they're trying to get rid of all the cows. So much fear mongering that was going into this. And like, and everyone was feeding into it. Ted Cruz says, I hope to see PETA supporting the Republican Party now that the Democrats want to kill all the cows. Tell me, Ted Cruz, how the hell do you get your hamburgers if you don't kill all the cows? But I digress. Like this is like no, this is what we're talking about here. People actually coalescing around the issue of eating meat as a vital aspect of their identity. And so we tried to explore that in greater detail. Is this a trend that was actually like, or excuse me, was this part of a trend that was um, that was going on over the past decade? And yeah, yeah, it kind of is. This is an article from Mike.com in 2017. Um, Chloe, you and I were talking about this like when we were uh, riding over. Milk is the new creamy symbol of white racial purity in Donald Trump's America. Um, and why is it? First of all, this is absurd. These people are like chugging gallons of milk. Sure, I've never done this a day in my life. But um, but really, like you know, this is like this is really bizarre to me. Like people say that like oh Sebastian, you're just pushing your diversity agenda too far. I'm not the person who is standing around shirtless, like drinking milk by the gallon, like some sort of insane person. That is ridiculous. No, like I'm just recognizing something that the white nationalists are telling on themselves. Why are they doing this? Because it is a sign of their genetics or racial um, superiority because people of color are traditionally like more lactose intolerant than people who are of Northern European heritage. And so you see these people just trying to prove their like genetic superiority by drinking milk. So when people say like, no, these are completely separate issues. No, these issues are very deeply intertwined and it continues, it goes um, even further than that. Oops, I went too far. I wasn't able to, yeah, I wasn't able to actually get the video to play or maybe I can get the video to play. This is actually Sarah Palin um, at the All-American New Year's Eve. If, you're familiar at all with American politics, you recognize that Sarah Palin was the one time vice presidential hopeful when she was running with John McCain um, uh, in, in the election against President Barack Obama. But um, Fox News during the All-American New Year actually asked her what her New Year's resolutions were. And so she answers with this. And joining us now is Fox's contributor and former 
Alaska Governor Sarah Palin live in Wasilla. How you doing, Governor? And Happy New Year. I'm Ooh. doing great. Thank you. Happy, happy, happy. You guys look like you're having a blast. Yeah. Heck yeah, I take them real seriously. And uh, I have three this year. First one is eat more meat. Don't worry, they get deeper as I go, the next resolutions. Um, I am going to try to help America, all of us as individuals, make our federal government as irrelevant in our lives as possible. And then the third resolution is to take former UCLA coach John Wooden's pyramid of success and live it out because it's imperative, you guys, that we as individuals do all we can to live with industriousness and self-discipline and selflessness so that together as a whole, our nation can be restored to her exceptionalism. Well stated. So, I know, laugh, like that was like, that was banana pants. Um, so Sarah Palin, she, had, she actually, like, like, like I said, she has three New Year's resolutions, and the first one was eat more meat. And the second one, and she did get deeper as she went, make the American government as irrelevant to our lives as possible. And then the third resolution, and perhaps the most telling resolution, was to restore America to its exceptionalism. And so why does she start with, there were no rabid vegans around or like any, like, you know, any progressive people that, like, that, that were threatening her. Why did she start with eating more meat? Why is it important to her to eat more meat? And the reason is, this is like a dog whistle, if I can say dog whistle, I'm not sure if that's like, no, because that's politically correct for me to say as a vegan myself. But yeah, like this is a way of signaling to other white people that this is a sign of solidarity. This is a measure of how we like achieve proper whiteness in our culture, in American culture. Um, and it's one of the ways that we show each other that we are true, quote, Americans. Um, it is a way of, quote, owning the libs, if you will. So eating meat is definitely a sign of white solidarity in her eyes and in the eyes of other people who identify with this. And so when we're talking about identity politics, you can't divorce the two, in particular when you're talking about white identity politics. Um, and then, of course, she finishes off by talking about America's exceptionalism. Eating meat paves a path to American exceptionalism, if you, if you will. And um, that, that should be, like, it's funny, but it's also an incredibly scary thing to see someone talking about. Um, and of course, Sarah Palin is alone. I'm going to the next slide. There we go. This actually is um, a story that was from May of this year. Um, it was published in the Daily Wire, which is Ben Shapiro's publication. Um, it's a gunshot billboard mocking the squad sparks outrage. Um, Rashida Tlaib uh, says, like, it's inciting violence. <clears throat> Excuse me, inciting violence. Um, the story, actually, as it's written, is basically about a gunshot that had run an advertising campaign. Um, there was a billboard that they had up on a highway um, with the quote, four horsemen, which are, of course, the freshman congresswomen of color that most of us are familiar with. Um, you've got Ilhan Omar, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Rashida Tlaib, and um, Ayanna Presley. And um, so it's talking about these four, uh, four horsemen, of course, like in a completely joking way, but um, part of the advertising campaign was this quote that you see here. It says, all right, my fellow infidels for Trump. Again, pay very specific attention to the language that they're using, the language of infidels. Um, it invites a like sort of religious um, understanding of, of, this kind of, of this conversation as well. It says, due to overwhelming demand, you may come by the shop next week and get your very own Four Horsemen comic sticker. How do you do it? Simple. Eat a piece of bacon. Tell us you're voting for Trump in 2020, and then get your limited edition bumper sticker while supplies last. Snowflakes and liberals are not eligible. Sorry. And so how do you get your bumper sticker? Once again, it's by eating a piece of bacon. Why is it important to eat a piece of bacon? And like this is really interesting because like most people will probably tell you, oh, it's just a joke, it doesn't really mean anything at all. But of course these things do have meaning. Because what do we know about bacon? It's a food that Jewish people do not eat, it's a food that Muslim people do not eat. There are prohibitions, specific religious prohibitions, against eating these specific animals. And so when you're eating a piece of bacon, what you're doing is once again showing a sign of solidarity with other true Americans who are also truly Christian people. Um, but of course, like, you know, like these are all jokes. Like what we're talking about are things that are like, you know, the, these are these are symbols. 
but they're they're disguised in a way as like as just humor, as just like reckless humor, just a thing that people say. But this isn't just language. This isn't just a thing that people say. This is part of what people have adopted as um, as, as aspects of their culture. Um, and then we go on because we started talking about like religious signifiers as well. This is actually Rick Wiles, um, a televangelist, and um, I wasn't able to get the video for this for, for the presentation, but like I'll just read the quote to you. Rick Wiles is actually talking about um, veggie burgers, if you can believe it. And he goes on this bizarre tangent. He says, God is an environmentalist. He takes this very seriously, as do we, Rick Wiles. Um, he created this planet, he created the universe, and he's watching these Luciferians destroy this planet, destroy the animal kingdom, destroy the plant kingdom, and change human DNA. Why? They want to change human DNA so that you can't be born again. That's where they're going with this, to change the DNA. Oh my God, it's just, like, this is really, this is, this is bizarre. This is like walking through the looking glass. I can't believe that I'm reading this out loud. Um, change the DNA of humans so that it will be impossible for a human to be born again. They want to create a race of soulless creatures on this planet. Did you know that that was the actual agenda of Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods? <laughs> yeah, if you look at their website, it actually says that. We just want to change the DNA of the human race so that we can create a race of soulless creatures on this planet. I'm one of them, by the way. But but this is like yeah, but this is what we're talking about. Like you know, and we can laugh about it and we can joke about it. It is incredibly funny to us. But also at the same time, people pay attention to this. Rick Wiles is by no stretch of the imagination an unpopular figure among people who identify with religious fundamentalism, and specifically Christian fundamentalism in the United States. And so when he says these things, people are listening. And it doesn't matter what your Beyond Burgers are made of. By the way, Beyond Burgers are actually made of all natural ingredients. Um, it doesn't matter. Like he's, he's actually inciting people through this complete fiction to just to, to move away from veggie burgers because they are an existential threat to their way of life. And when we're talking about their way of life, yeah, people will say, no, this has absolutely nothing to do with like bikers, like that's absurd. And what are you talking about? But really, like again, when you put all of the clues together, that is exactly what we're talking about. And like, you know, when and what we're actually addressing here is like this this crisis of white, often masculinity. Like that, that needs to be addressed. Um, people are terrified of like of not eating animals. Um, it is a threat to their very existence in so many ways. Um, but there is a name for it. There is a name for like for, for this type of behavior. Um, I actually didn't know what it was myself. Um, it's gastro nationalism, where food production is assigned symbolic value by those who articulate nationalist sentiments, and domestically produced food is assumed to be safer than food imported from abroad. Um, and it's not just limited to the United States, by the way. Um, nationalism as a construct actually, of course, came from Europe. Like, it was a European invention somewhere around the 18th, 19th century. Um, so to, like, you know, to, to actually apply any type of like, you know, qualifiers to nationalism, like, that, like, that's almost redundant in a way. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, what you're looking at in this image is uh, Dutch dairy giant Cantina. Um, they have added the flag to their milk so that people know that this is good Dutch milk. Um, nationalist sentiment, in particular white nationalist sentiment, it, it goes a long, long way. Um, and it's not limited to Europe or the United States either. Um, this is, I'm just roller skating through this presentation now because I want to make sure that I leave time for questions at the end. So I apologize for like moving super fast with the slides. Um, I just wanted to address this as well. Like this is um, a vegan protest um, that was declared un-Australian by Scott Morrison, the uh, Australian Prime Minister. Um, there were like you, you could read the byline at the bottom. It says Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has criticized animal rights activists as shameful and un-Australian after dozens of them were arrested in nationwide protests. Um, the three main animals, and because we're not, we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to like ask you if you can name the three main animals that are farmed um, in animal agribusiness in Australia. They're cows, goats, and sheep. Um, when Scott Morrison says that it's un-Australian to protest the farming of these animals, what Scott Morrison doesn't tell you is that none of these animals are indigenous to Australia. And so when he's actually saying that it's un-Australian, what exactly is Australian identity if he's actually talking about animals that never came from there and had no business there until white people showed up? And so like this is unintentionally, once again, telling on ourselves. 
I, I just want to throw these out there because like, you know, I, I talk about this a lot in, in different countries and people think that they're exempt from this type of behavior or that it doesn't apply to them. No, this is a global phenomenon. And like, you know, and white identity is very closely tied to eating, um, eating animals and farming animals. Um, but I also want to address the fact that it's not limited specifically to just the eating of animals. Uh, this is an article, like this is a direct quote too, by the way. Animal rights groups are lesbian terrorists who want to take over government. Um, and this is a quote from a trapping advocate. He says, animal rights activists are terrorist groups, mostly led by lesbians, who destroy property and burn down animal research facilities for their cause. And progressives, in their march, once again, toward communism, um, are trying to ban trapping. They'll get rid of hunting, too, after they take over the government of the United States. First of all, once again, this is actually part of the agenda. If you go to our website, it's all over there. I love lesbians. They are definitely the leaders of this movement. Um, I think that he's absolutely right. I have no idea how he got a hold of the manifesto. But, like, but he's definitely on to something here. But, but yeah, like, you know, and so this isn't just specifically only about like the eating of animals, the use of animals in any way, the use of animals as textiles. Um, people are deeply threatened by this. And like, and yeah, like anyone who, like, it, when we're talking about identity politics, it's impossible to get away from the us versus them dichotomy. Everybody who is not part of like, you know, the, the capitalist patriarchy, if you will, um, the white male patriarchy, like, you know, these are a part of those progressive circles that like, you know, that are trying to take something away from us. And once again, the fear mongering around leading us down a path toward communism, which again, was one of the images that was like invoked over and over and over again at CPAC last year. Um, yeah, as we like, as we continue through this, I'm going to go, I'm only going to go for about 10 more minutes. I'll skip a few slides. But, um, but yeah, like there are also specific archetypes that people invoke when they have conversations about, like, you know, about who is a proper uh, American. Um, the American cowboy is one of those. The story of the cowboy begins as the Civil War ends. After the war, cattle were in considerable demand, and Texas was the home of most cattle ranches. Texas would eventually be the leading supplier of beef for most of the country. Happening simultaneously was the opening of the frontier and the shift west for settlers. The cowboy's job was to herd and transport cattle from ranch to market. Um, there, were, there was lots of demand for beef after the Civil War. The last line is of particular importance. It says the historical cowboy also included many former slaves, vaqueros from Mexico, and new immigrants. So how do we come from a place where like, the people who were primarily cowboys were like former slaves, vaqueros from Mexico, and the immigrants to this as the archetypal image of the American cowboy? It's a very interesting journey. The like, American cowboy exists on three distinct levels. The historical level, about which the average American cares and knows no more than he does, knows no more than he does about any other phase of non-military or non-political history. The fictional level, in which the cowboy occupies a not quite respectable but highly popular position. And, and this is the most important, the folklore level, on which the um, cowboy sits as an idealized creation of the American folk mind. It is in this way that the cowboy almost becomes a American manifestation of the fabled knight. This is a person that we get to hold up as someone who is a unique part of American history and an integral part of American identity. The cowboy brings us this beef that we are so proud of in the grand American tradition. And to take that away, to not actually consume that, is distinctly un-American in the racist imagination. And so it's not just the cowboy that we talk about here in, in these endearing um, and often idealized ways. It's the American farmer as well. How often do we hear our politicians on both the left and the right actually have this idealized archetypal image of the American farmer that is wholesome, that is like patriotic, um, that is again nationalistic and sort of jingoistic. Um, but when we talk about the American farmer, we're very rarely talking about the people who bring us our broccoli and our kale. No, no, no. The American farmer is the person who has all of these beautiful animals around them. And the American farmer, despite the fact that like farms are these incredibly industrious operations in the 21st century, like the American farmer looks like this idealized nuclear family unit um, that is oftentimes white. Not at all what farms actually look like with that actually have primarily people of color working in them. Um, these factory operations that are incredibly dangerous, toxic 
places for people to live in and work around, or excuse me, to live around and work in. I got that backwards. I get very nervous talking in front of large groups of people. <laughs> Um, and yeah, the industry, the animal um, exploiting industries are actually catching on to this. And, um, and they're actually, like they, it's like a very familiar call and response style type of conversation that happens. Um, they are actually exploiting these, these conversations that people are having as well. And they're parroting the same type of propaganda back to, the, to their primary consumers. This is a quote from Beef Magazine, and yes, Beef Magazine is a thing that exists. It says that the fight to the center of the dinner plate is on if tofu, beans, and lentils become the number one recommendation as the plant-based protein substitutes to beef. Then we have not only failed our own industry, but we failed the children. The military, we failed the children! <laughs> Won't somebody think of the children? <laughs> We failed the military again, calling on very familiar tropes, um, very fear-mongering, patriotic, nationalistic tropes whenever we invoke the military. Hospital patients, nursing home residents who will eat according to the new dietary guidelines for Americans. So this author is very distinctly and very explicitly saying that like, if you don't eat beef, then the bricks are going to come out of the walls, the beams are going to drop from the very ceiling, up is going to become down, black will be white, cats and dogs will be living together. Communism <laughs> is going to take us all out. And so, yeah, like, you know, there are these, these very threatening vibes that are coming from the animal exploiting industries themselves. And what also comes along with that, you, you actually realize, is that, like, you know, this is, again, part of like, I think Reese Harper talks about it in terms of like the new white man's burden. Um, I'm sorry that reality hurts you. This is a quote actually from, that I pulled from, um, from, from Facebook. This is from a post on Farm Girl Fitness. Um, definitely check out that page if you want to have a laugh. But like, I'll explain the quote in a moment, but this person's actually talking to a vegan person who like, you know, was having a conversation with them on their page. Um, they say, I'm sorry this, this, that reality hurts you, but I can't help that dairy cows are happy and well cared for on the whole. I've actually worked on cattle farms and those cows have happy lives too. In the wild, these animals would not exist. Although I'm very much in favor of bringing back the wild bison, which by the way, white people had decimated in the 1800s in their quest to actually eliminate the American Indians, but I digress. You should know that through traditional hunter-gatherers, that both, I'm sorry, traditional hunter-gatherers also intervene heavily in the herds regardless. So again, humans have done better, and the bottom of that quote is cut off. Humans have done better than nature. Certainly there are things that can always be improved upon, but I doubt that's what you want. You don't want happier cows. If you did, you would work in cooperation with farmers. You want to feel superior, and whatever lies you need to tell, big videos you need to produce, et cetera, et cetera, you will. Um, at Farm Girl Fitness, I suggest you block these commenters. They have nothing but bad faith attacks. Now, to actually dissect this, like, you know, when I say the people who are working in the industries are actually, like, cooperative in this, like, white nationalist rhetoric, there is a very real move to actually frame animal agriculture as part of the project of civilization. This is something that we do that is part of the common good. We can do better than nature. We are better than nature. And so, like, you know, when we're talking about how we have engineered animals by stealing their reproductive autonomy and their bodily autonomy, and to have enslaved them and turned them into political prisoners, as well as actual prisoners, um, yeah, like, we're talking about something that is good for them. And so, like, when I say that we are taking on the white man's burden, this is, like, this is our burden. This is something that we do because it is righteous to do so. This is all part of the project of civilization. Um, this is a quote from Sigmund Freud that we're reading here. It um, actually comes up in three parts. The principal task of civilization, um, its actual raison d'etre, is to defend us against nature. But no one is under the illusion that nature has already been vanquished, and few dare hope that she will ever be entirely subjugated to man. Um, this part of the quote is like, it, it's incredibly telling. Once again, we're framing civilization as something that a project that like, white men have undertaken for the good of everyone. And notice that the language here is incredibly like sexist as well. Like nature is framed as a woman um, that needs to be tamed by man, that needs to be subjugated, although not entirely, just enough, just enough. Um, and like the like to, to think that like on the previous slide we have like you know farm girl fitness actually participating in this type of like deeply sexist and misogynistic um, 
the project as well, but it goes on to talk about the project of civilization. There are the elements which seem to mock at all human control. The earth which quakes and is torn apart and buries all human life and its works. Water which <clears throat> deluges and drowns everything in turmoil. Storms which blow everything before them. So not only is nature a woman, but she is also a brutal, psychopathic woman, a dangerous woman um, who needs to be controlled and dominated by man. Um, with these forces, nature rises up against us, majestic, cruel, and inexorable. She brings to our mind once more our weakness and our hopelessness, which we thought to escape, once again, through the work of civilization. So, like, yeah, the animal agriculture industry is part of this project of civilization that we're talking about, this project, this ongoing project of, like, you know, of, of white domination um, across the world. And this was in, in, in 1927. This was part of the early 20th century. So it's not by any means new, but the way that it's being used by people who are engaging in, like, white identity politics in the 21st century, it's very, very unique. And it's been going on, I would dare say, since about the birth of the Tea Party movement in the uh, like 2010s. Um, but as I close out, and I just have a few more slides here, um, I want to address the ways that like people of color also get co-opted into playing white identity <clears throat> politics. Um, this is like this is actually, and I'll explain all of this um, like in, in greater detail. What you're looking at is actually a slide from a, um, or excuse me, a, a screenshot from a Facebook post from Dr. Johnny Green who is a pastor in uh, New York. Um, and it says, let's go to New York City Hall and let our voices be heard. Come go with us to make our voices heard. Buses will board at 1 o'clock in the park for City Hall at 1.30. And we'll return at 4. A hot box lunch will be served. And there will be a name drawing for a $250 American Express gift card. What's he talking about? I'll tell you. Um, there was a measure in the city of New York um, in like around the spring of 2019 to actually ban the sale of new fur in New York City. And what the fur lobby had done was actually get involved in um, the like basically the heart of like like American uh, black civil rights movements and um, and social movement centers. Um, where do black people primarily organize? We organize through the church. And so to prevent this measure from going through, they wanted to frame the sale of new fur or banning the sale of new fur as something that was racist against black people. And so what do we do? We have black people come and protest because if there's anything the politicians don't want, it's to be looked at as potentially racist. That's an extremely bad look, at least if you frame yourself as a progressive. If you're Donald Trump or one of the modern day Republicans, you're given a medal for it, quite literally, if you watch the State of the Union and you saw Rush Limbaugh. Um, this is another post. I'm sorry, that one was from that one was from Twitter. This one's actually from Facebook. Um, he says, come get on the bus with the MPAC on May 8th, 2019. Mm -hmm. Free lunch and beverages will be served. Um, it says, the bus ride is free on a first come, first ride basis. We're going to tell Speaker Corey Johnson and the city council that we have a right to buy and wear our pink coats. We must stop this political overreach by our elected officials when there are other issues that they could be resolving. Wow. How many people like actually imagine that this was a burning issue for black people unless it was introduced to them by someone who had financial vested interest in making it important to black people? How many of us think that like black people were just going around wearing fur coats in the middle of May? <laughs> It just wasn't something that was happening. It just isn't something that's happening. I don't even know any black people who earn mink coats, or excuse me, who own, who own mink coats. Like, we just simply are not wearing fur in numbers that great. We're just not going around using animals as textiles. I, I, thought, I would have thought this was something more believable if actually we were talking about Canada goose, because at least you see far more people walking around with that. But no, we weren't talking about Canada goose. We're talking about people just wearing fur coats walking around in the middle of, um, in, in the middle of May. Um, and so yeah, like what you're looking at right here is, is people, black people who were primarily mobilized by white people in order to do their dirty work for them. And, um, and this, this, this really burns me up. This actually makes me extraordinarily angry because that should have been an easy win. When I talk about like the natural commonality between social movements for animal rights and for black liberation, like, this was an easy thing for me. When I actually found out what happens to animals, like, that was a natural extension of, like, of my black liberation work, as it has been for many, many people before me. 
And so this should have been like an easy win to actually get more black people on our side. But because a large contingent of the mainstream animal rights movement is not really as invested in us as I would like them to be, like you just basically offer our natural allies up to people on the other side and they welcome them with very, very open arms. And that is so extremely dangerous, <coughs> more so than I can describe to you in just a couple of minutes. But yeah, so you have these people who were part of the fur industry that actually had put on blackface in the physical form of black faces going down to City Hall and perform their protest for them. And you see all of these sign holders actually walking around and the faces of those people are black. But you see the people who are distributing those signs to them, these homemade signs, are not black. And this is one of the ways in which we get co-opted into playing white identity politics for white people who do not have our interests. These are industries that are like that primarily are run by white people to benefit white people for the financial gain of other white people. And we call ourselves black liberationists, and this is just not the case. This is not the path to black liberation. And then you look at online communities for this. This is a coalition of blacks prefer. If you go to Facebook, and I definitely encourage you to do it after this presentation, you can actually take a look at some of the people who are part of the coalition of blacks prefer. And as you read through this list, and as you look at the faces, curiously, none of them are black. In fact, the very first person's name is Becky. <laughs> this is disgusting, and it is utterly disgraceful. It's the exploitation of animals and the exploitation of black humans in the worst possible way. And the fact that we don't realize this, the fact that we attach ourselves to the very narratives of people that have chosen to exploit us should absolutely infuriate every single black person in this room and beyond. But yeah, we have unfortunately become very invested in aspects of white identity um, in, this, like, you know, in the American culture that we live in. But I just want to tell people as we close out, and we've only got three more slides, that like, yeah, we have a long and very proud history of black liberation and animal liberation sharing that commonality and expressing it very, very, um, very, very uh, vocally. Uh, this is actually a quote from Janine Africa, who was part of the Philadelphia Move organization. And some of you who have heard me speak before have heard me talk about Move. Uh, this quote actually says, we demonstrated against puppy mills, zoos, circuses, any form of enslavement of animals. We demonstrated against Three Mile Island and industrial pollution. We demonstrated against police brutality, and we did so uncompromisingly. Slavery never ended, it was just disguised. I had actually written an essay in homage to that quote from Janine, Af um, from Janine Africa. The Philadelphia Move Organization was a black liberation group in the 1970s and 1980s that like, was in Philadelphia. These people were mostly vegan and they had adopted a back to nature lifestyle. And they had a philosophy of caring for the vulnerable. Um, from this quote right here, this was from Ed Pilkington who was writing for The Guardian in 2018. Then there were the dogs. When the 1978 siege happened, a siege against the MOVE organization um, in their homes in 1978 from the police, there were 12 adults and 11 children in a MOVE house in Powelton Village. Had 48 dogs. Uh, most of the animals were strays taken in by the group as part of its philosophy of caring for the vulnerable. Black liberation, animal liberation, the two were as one with MOVE. John Africa was known as the dog man as he was rarely seen without one. And it really hurts my soul that whenever I talk to a lot of black people today about the importance and necessity of incorporating animal liberation into our work of black liberation, they look at me with disdain. They tell me that like, oh, you want poor people to eat rice and beans. This is racist and this is classist. And it infuriates me because these people do not understand their own history. This is our history. This is part of black history. This is important to us. And a black liberation that does not incorporate animal liberation is incomplete on its face. There, I said it. I know that it's not popular. Like I said, I don't have a lot of friends. That's OK. More vegan pizza for me. <laughs> I didn't come to make friends. I came to actually speak honestly and authentically to everyone in this room. But there is a very real and present danger that is happening right now all around us. When I tell you that like white nationalism and people who engage in white natural, or excuse me, white identity politics are using animal exploitation as a means of showing their solidarity, what can we do? 
as an act of political resistance? What can we make ourselves a part of that disassociates and takes power away from those institutions? And I think that being vegan is one of those very, very easy things that most of us can adopt as best we're able to. And so this is the last slide. Solidarity, this is where I always like to close out my presentations. It says solidarity is not a matter of altruism. Solidarity comes from the inability to tolerate the affront to our own integrity of passive or active collaboration in the oppression of others. And from the deep recognition, recognition that, like it or not, our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on the planet. Like it or not, our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on this planet. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's not racist to suggest that we can eat more rice and beans in our lives. Maybe we're racist and classist for having thought that we're too good to eat rice and beans. Thank you all. But like, you know, but most of us are very unconscious about these, like you know, these, these blind spots that we have in our everyday lives. And so, yeah, we aren't going around thinking that we're being bigoted, but we're engaging in bigotry every day, in like you know, in, in these like in these microaggressions and sometimes macroaggressions. And like, and eating bacon is just one of those things. Eating bacon, if like you know, like for those of you who are diehards, and you came to my presentation last year, you've already seen bacon isn't even something that we were eating 100 years ago. Bacon was like, people say, oh, I love bacon so much. No, the fuck you don't. You don't love bacon. <laughs> what you love is actually a decades-long campaign of like propaganda that was given to us by Edward Bernays, um, who is the father of modern public relations. 
And he invented bacon, well he didn't invent bacon, but he invented bacon as a breakfast food that more Americans would eat. And so yeah, like this was just a campaign that was started by somebody who was trying to prop up the pork industry, which wanted to sell more pork at the time. And so like, you know, that's like, this is, so yeah, when people say like, none of our cosmic, none of our decisions about what we eat and how we consume are made in a bubble. Um, so people say they love bacon. No, you don't love bacon. You know, like you, you, you are engaging in something that was given to you, again, by institutions of white supremacy and white nationalism. So thank you again for that, for that. And you, with the hat and the plaid shirt, you have your question. Um, yeah, how, I'm curious, how widespread is the concept of gastro nationalism, and is it always like, negatively um, associated with um, stuff like this? Because I think you know this is kind of like food sovereignty um, battle where this might be like either you know, in a positive way. Wow, okay, so you like you, you actually like asked a lot of things at once, and I'm going to try to remember all of them when I answer your question, because that was a very good question. I don't want to, like, let's start with nationalism um, before we put the gastro qualifier on it. I don't want to characterize nationalism as good or bad. Nationalism is just simply a thing that happened, and it's something that we live with now. Um, and like, you know, like more likely than not, all of us engage in nationalism in like several different ways. Um, like, you know, we, we're very tribal in our identities as humans, so it happens more often than we, than we are consciously aware of once again. Um, so like gastro-nationalism, it is becoming increasingly common. Um, when I had stumbled across the term, like, you know, people have been writing papers on gastro-nationalism, academic papers, um, as far back as I had seen, like 2012, 2013, and I can't remember, Michael D'Souza, Michael D'Souza, um, I'm sorry, like the name just popped into my head, it didn't wake until 3 a.m., like wake me up in the night. That's the name of one of the academics that has written about um, gastro-nationalism. Um, He's the most popular one that um, that I think that I think coined the term. Now they've got me on camera, so like you know, someone's going to come back and say, "I have to say it." I have to say. And, and and I will have been wrong, but but yeah, like um, so so gastro nationalism is something that people have increasingly been flirting with in the twenty first century. Um, I don't I don't think that gastro nationalism, just like nationalism, has to be bad. Um, I don't think that, like, you know, like it's, it is what we, it, it's, it's, it's what we bring to it, it's what we make of it. Um, like, all of these concepts, we, like, you know, you get out of them what you bring to them. Um, I personally don't, like, you know, I don't see a lot of value in nationalism. Um, part of the, like, you know, part of the project of decolonization should be to, like, you know, like, for those of us who are interested in decolonizing our lives, should be to move away from nationalism because like it could both be a very toxic type of identity in um, in many ways. Um, but that's not it's not the fault of nationalism itself necessarily. Um, it's it's how it has been like broadly applied. Um, and I'm sorry, there was like a third part to your question that like um, you were talking about food sovereignty, I think. Yeah, just a different interpretation of that um, gastro yeah, like food sovereignty, I think, like it's an, it's actually a really important tool, because if we like you know like I'm talking to a group of people who like I'm assuming are like largely progressive themselves, but we don't want to like just speak to an echo chamber all the time. One of the things that I like you know that I, I talk to people about is like you know how do we talk to our more right of center counterparts about issues of like you know of, of plant based diets and the importance of like biodiversity. And like you know, and, and concepts of animality. Most of the time, people like you know who are right and center that I have engaged with don't want to talk about like you know animality and like you know and discrimination against other animals or even people of color. That's you know, it's not exactly okay. It doesn't thrill me, but at the same time, it forces me to have to learn how to have conversations with people who are not like myself. And to that end, concepts of food sovereignty actually resonate with them in ways that like, you know, all of the other like conversations that we have about like about like institutional violence against animals do not resonate with them. And yeah, like, you know, what plant-based foods actually do give us is greater food sovereignty. Like we can produce far more food in the United States if we actually, you know, switch to a plant-based diet. If we talk to people about like, you know, about the issue of like of plant-based eating as a matter of national security. That gets people's attention. If we talk about the massive, massive subsidies, like you know, that we give to the dairy industry and the like, you know, and the beef industry, 
these are things that resonate with people who are more likely to not engage with me on a level in having conversations about um, about like you know animal violence and, and veganism in the way that I would like to talk about them. So yeah, like you know, like food sovereignty is a really really important thing. Um, and I'm really glad that you brought that up because I don't get to talk about that too often in front of like you know progressive folks. So are there any other questions? Who else have we got? Or you all can like clear out and like eat the donuts. There's still a bunch of them left. Sarah. Every few weeks I see in here like a new article about how small pet, like small free range farms with like free range happy animals are gonna save the world. Oh, yeah. I was wondering, like obviously that logic is so flawed, but I was wondering I if you <laughs> had an extra component to add to it because I think that the like having them, the, 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 the same arguments of like, well, all of the grains that you're saying are bad go to animals, like those arguments don't work with those people. So I'm, Kind of wondering if you've got like the next level of the white supremacist element in that sort of. Thing. Yeah, once again, like you know, we're like when we're having conversations about this, like to, to add to the like the conversation about about like whiteness and white identity as tied to eating animals. Like you know, we're very very attached with to eating animals, and I, I I love it when I'm having conversations with primarily vegan people, and they. Like you know, and 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 they incorporate like you know, oh like like we're we're eating fewer animals now because like there's less beef and this, or there's less pork. People aren't really eating fewer animals. We're just shifting the burden onto smaller animals that can be produced more like you know, quote sustainably, even though there is no such thing as sustainable animal agriculture. Um, and like you know, and when we engage in this sort of utilitarian like you know conversation about like animal exploitation and 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 yeah like it it, it really it, it forces people who want to eat animals to eat different animals. Um, we, we're now talking about I can't believe it, but we're talking about like oh man we 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 need to have protein and so we're going to start farming crickets and make cricket flour and this is like this is actually a thing that's happening right now. I'm not like you know I'm not making this up. This isn't like in the not too distant future. This is right now. People are like selling cricket flour in upscale stores like Whole Foods and stuff like that because, oh my god, like this is the next best thing and this is where I can get all of my protein. Completely bypassing soybeans and black beans and lentils and like nuts and pulses and literally everything else because so much of our identity is wrapped up in actually having to consume protein from an animal source. So like, yeah, it just gets smaller and smaller rather than like just eliminating animal exploitation altogether. So now we're not eating cows, but we're eating bunny rabbits that could be farmed on some rooftop in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, like you know, by some hipster who has like an astonishing like amount of facial hair. Um, <laughs> and we're like you know, and and like you know, and and like I don't know, like Becky with the yoga pants is now like you know, she's now eating crickets. Um, as part of our keto diet, and I'm like, oh wow, this is, this is where we are. So, like, you know, this is what we're doing now, and, and yeah, it is like it's, it's completely disgusting to me, and I abhor it. So, like, thanks for thanks for bringing that up. And it's like, now you all have this vision of like, you know, cricket flour that's going to haunt your dreams too. And I'm glad because I was tired of carrying that burden by myself. <laughs> Anyone else? Is it? Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more of a comment. Yeah, let's hear your comment. But I noticed uh, the slide you had about the Australian Prime Minister declaring like, yeah. the animal rights activists and non-Australian. And uh, I think it was actually just today, he made a, a similar sentiment on Twitter um, about this uh, football stadium in Australia that was serving vegan pies. Yes. And he, he used the exact same phrase he said to people who purchased it. It's not Australian. Australian. <laughs> and I thought it was really fascinating that in a space of like this football stadium that is like, somewhat central to like, I guess, like Australian culture like it's a very prominent thing in their society. He was finding a way to, to say like, yeah, even if you like go to like a football game or something, but if you buy this vegan pie, then you're not really Australian. Kind of. And this, I thought that was kind of like another layer to, to that. Aspect. This is great. Oh, I want this to come up so okay. bad. Like, is it going to happen for me or what? So no signal. Oh, no. Like, I actually, like, there's a video, like, you know, of the, like, you know, of, of, of this guy. This, oh. Can you? Yeah, you're going to make it work. Actually, I've got to plug the back in. Snap it out. Put it back in again. 
It's a video of this guy actually eating like a um, holy shit, that totally works. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, like, yeah, a politician calls plant based tie this football match is un Australian in the Facebook video rant. And so you see him, like, do we have a link to the, like, oh, it's like, it's vegan pies at football street. He's like, yeah, like, so he's, he's, he's like, whining about this. Like, I've never seen bigger crybabies than people who, like, you know, like, so he's under no obligation to eat this fucking, like, pie. <laughs> like, nobody's worth it, but just the presence of it has annoyed him so much. That he's just sitting here looking as grim as the day is long, complaining about, like, you know, about the presence of these pies at, like, you know, at, so yeah, like, it, it, he did, he, he just did this, like, within the past 24 hours. So he's got a real gripe with people who don't eat animals, because there's something wrong with that for some inexplicable reason, although entirely explicable. Anybody else? Yeah, front row. Yeah, I, I was really interested by the, uh, the cricket story. And, yeah, I wonder, how do you compare a world where, uh, say, people eat 100 cows compared to 10,000 cricket equivalents or 20 chickens? And, I mean, it's clear that you, you're unhappy with both of them, but um, how do you balance that? Eating crickets for protein. That's um, only small, like small bucks. How do we compare? Like, you know, like this is like this is actually one of those like, you know, animal ethics questions that becomes like really philosophical really quickly. Um, first of all, I'm not fucking eating crickets. <laughs> like under the best of circumstances. So this is just like, you know, like I can't imagine and it's not just like crickets either. We're actually talking about getting milk from cockroaches because like, you know, it's gonna to be too hard in the future to actually get milk from cows. This is like rows and rows of like oatly and like you know and, and like plant-based milk and silk sitting on like the store shelves all across the world. But like you know what? Yeah, we're going to actually start like you know getting our milk from cockroaches. But yeah, like from a purely utilitarian perspective, if we believe that like insects are animals and these are sentient animals, then like we have an ethic of care that we have to apply to them as well. Um, and like you know, and I think that most of us do. Like on an individual basis, I'm not a fan of a lot of mosquitoes. Um, and I'm still working on my personal relationship with spiders, which is not great right now. But, which I think that that's great. But like, you know, but like, on, like to actually institute, like, you know, the farming of these individuals, like, you know, for absolutely no reason whatsoever because you don't have protein needs for them on a large scale for human consumption. It's just like, you know, I would still categorize that as like a moral or ethical law. So, so yeah, like on, on, on an individual basis, wouldn't do it on an institutional basis. Like, you know, like it's, it's like, I, I just like, I can't eat them. And yet we're selling it. Like, for, first of all, it's also really expensive right now. Like four ounces is 12 bucks. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I would like pay 12, 12 bucks for by the ounce that I won't talk about in like, you know, university setting, but, yeah, like cricket powder is now one of them. And look, it's like somebody has obviously put it into a smoothie with a paper straw, no less. And so, like, yeah, like, it's a, and, and they've declared it superfood. Just like, wow, there's a lot I can say about this, but like, we won't even get into it. Like, just one more, and then we'll, we'll clear out the room. Yes? Um, do you think this has anything to do with the idea that everyone needs to drink, transition into veganism versus just go out cold? What about the idea of transitioning to veganism? Um, like there's, um, you've seen Game Changer? I have heard of this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see it, but like. Okay. It's a good one. Um, they talk in the end about just uh, sort of convincing your friend just to do like a one day a week for vegan. Yeah. Versus just going all vegan all the way. Yeah, yeah. And do you think this has anything to do with that transition period that they have from going to eating red meats, like calories and chickens to I don't. Um, like, you know, I, I fully support people transitioning in, like, whatever ways that they, like, you know, that they need to do that. Um, because, like, it's not, it's not an easy leap for everybody. Um, it's going to be a necessary leap, but we're going to continue living on this planet, let me tell y'all. But, like, you know, but it's not, like, it's not an easy leap for everyone, like, you know, emotionally or psychologically or however. Um, I don't class this as part of that leap, by the way, um, though, because, like, you know, this seems to be geared more towards the designer food market. 
like you know this is this is more one of those like you know this, these luxury things and so like if people are transitioning like you know to vegan then they probably are just going to consume fewer animal based products altogether and incorporate more like you know more they're they're going to consume fewer of the animal based products that are familiar to them and incorporate more plant based products so it's not like you know like you know, like yoga pants, Kathy is like out here. Like uh, apologies to anybody who's named Kathy. I'm probably just offended her. But like you know, like she's not just like you know, she's she's not saying, oh, I'm not going to eat meat. But you know what I will do as part of my vegan transition is I'm going to get some cricket powder and put that in my kale smoothie. Um, that's like there's no need for her to do that. Like she'll just probably like if she's making a smoothie and she needs to have protein in it, like you know, she's probably just going to put like a dollop of peanut butter or some whey protein that she already has. Like, uh, like if you're buying cricket powder, it's because you're a terrible person. I just can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. So like, well, okay. I said that's it. So like, so like, it, um, unless there's it, everybody, everybody's gonna thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Appreciate Cornell Animal, excuse me, Cornell Society or. Uh, Animal rights, animal welfare, I can't do it. It's getting late. I've been awake for like way too long. But thank you for bringing me out here again.